Hi, I'm Rex Burks. And I'm Owen Younger. And we are the Skeptical Texans. And we watch Atheist Edge. And so should you. Hello, welcome back to Atheist Edge. I am Chris. I am joined here today by Randall. And Randall, did you know that today, in the year 2019, the year of our Lord, that there are still people that think that the book of Genesis literally describes what happened to animals and humanity and life in general and how we got all the pain and suffering that we have going on today. Well, I live in the state of Texas, so it's kind of hard to avoid. It's definitely something we live, we deal with every day around here. Yeah, for those of you in liberal states, we envy you. But <laughs> yeah, it's very much a thing. And you can read any number of books and see any number of YouTube videos about Genesis 1, Genesis 2, talking about the creation of the universe as described in the Bible and just the various ridiculous, nonsensical things that those chapters have going on. I was just reading something about that the other day that, um, according to Genesis, um, Adam had to name all the animals in three and a half hours, every species. He must have been really just That's stretching by the time he got to like the ibex and the alpaca. I don't, <laughs> I don't know how he came up with those. He was just making shit up at that point. But I want to set those aside because those have been done. Oh, I really right. want to focus on chapters three and four, specifically the part in between the Bible does not talk about okay. because chapter three ends with uh, Adam and Eve having their sin discovered God kicks them out of the garden and then immediately starting in chapter four Cain is born you mean how the all-knowing God found out that they were sinning? oh yes he just happened to walking around one day and said, oh what happened this is unexpected no but there's a lot that would have had to go on there that is kind of... Christians have to read between the lines to try and make their case as to what that is and how that explains a lot of uh, biology and things like that. Well, I want to read into that a little bit okay. from a non-Christian perspective and try and figure out, okay, what that would have had to have been like because I think it would have had to just be an absolute shit show of unbelievable <laughs> proportions and I would really like to see that chapter in the Bible. Yeah, absolutely. I think, I think it would be great. So, the first thing you have to realize is that, according to the Bible, all animals were plant-eating. It says that in Genesis 1.30, says, To every beast of the earth and to every bird of the heavens, and to everything that creeps on the earth, everything that has the breath of life, I have given every green plant for food. So it doesn't say anything about carnivores, omnivores, is just they all eat plants. So it specifically mentions green plants? It says green plants. So I guess no tomatoes. I yeah. um, that, that's probably another thing. But so you have animals that need to go from eating plants to all of a sudden eating animals. And if you're one of those animals, you must have freaked right the fuck out when that was going on. Because mm -hmm. just this picture the the what the Bible would have you say the Garden of Eden was like. You, you could be a wolf chilling with your best buddy a deer, you're just <laughs> drinking from the stream or whatever, just being in harmony, and then something flips. You have no idea what's going on. If you're the wolf, suddenly you're looking over to your dear friend like, you know, you know Frank's looking kind of tasty today. <laughs> I don't know what it is, but I kind of want to rip his throat out and drink his blood. Well, you also had to flip their whole digestive system, their their teeth that were oh, designed yeah. to tear flesh. Just imagine what that would have been like. Like you have these teeth which are made for grinding plant matter, mm -hmm. and now they're all of a sudden just sharpening out of nowhere. So you're accidentally biting your own lip. Like, what the, what's going on here? And your insides are twisted up in knots because they have to. They're shrinking now. They're becoming a carnivore digestive system instead of an herbivore digestive system. And let's not forget, predators and prey animals have different eye setups, right? right? The predators have their eyes facing straight forward for with the ability, focus. With the ability to focus, yeah. Exactly. Focus, depth perception. Prey have their eyes on the side for to get that wide angle. And so your eyes have to be physically moving positions. And just picture how that would feel in your head to have your eyes just all of a sudden on their own accord just moving all over the place and your brain having to process this new image that it wasn't 
theoretically designed a process. Because you really got to focus to get to that aloe vera plant over there. Exactly. Yeah. You know, it's moving in the wind. You got to focus <laughs> on it. No, that's not how it works. And you know, all this stuff is going on, and you you just all you want to do is eat your friend. And and <laughs> now now picture now now picture the picture the flip side. Um, p picture being the deer in this situation. You're eating. You're, you're is having fun with your, your wolf buddy who you've never had any conflict with in your entire life. And now all of a sudden you're looking over and like, you know, Chuck's got this weird look in his eye that I've, I've never, dude, you, you okay? What's, what's going on with you? And he's just looking at you ravenously. And all of a sudden he's jumping on you. He's clawing at you. He's biting at you. And you have no conception of that any of this is even possible because it's never happened before in the history of the garden. And now your blood is everywhere. You you can't scream or anything because your throat is being attacked, and and then you're just dead, just out of nowhere. And and this is true for all prey. This is true for all potential targets for the new for all these new carnivores that are coming up, and they they have to flee or die basically, and their their entire world is being basically upended right and and keep in mind too these uh, unless god was somehow preparing for this from the get-go these animals don't have any means for dealing with predators like they would not have any had any reason to evolve camouflage for instance because there's nothing to hide from you wouldn't have those toads with the poisonous skin and bright colors to ward off predators because there were no predators to ward off. So you're in a situation where, you know every now, every now and again you hear about these stories of human colonists coming to new islands and they bring with them new animals like mm -hmm. cats or rats or some new, uh, some new creature that is an invasive species to the island. And so the existing species, they they don't have a means to, they haven't evolved to deal with these animals. They evolved to deal with the animals that are around them, and so this new invasive species just runs rampage over the entire place. Well, which which has really come into effect when human beings have had the ability to transport animals around. And this is this uh, I'm sure it happened in nature as well, mm -hmm. um, but to. Um, um, to assume that something like this was happening at the very beginning of time is, is, is kind of crazy. I, I heard an explanation one time from a theist, um, gosh, about how, um, you know, because everything's got to be literal, right? And uh, that it was um, not sinful that Cain and Abel had sex with their mother. I wish I could remember the explanation for that, but it was something that God put the sin in after that. Something mm -hmm. is a similar thing here, where God just puts in the ability for animals to suddenly need. Um, you know, the toads didn't have to have the poison until then. Mm -hmm. So now suddenly God gave them this this, this poison to uh, to make them fit in a world mm -hmm. filled with sin. But 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 think about what that makes God, and, and this is actually going to come up a couple more times, because God has to mitigate the damage that has been caused because the, the reason I brought the invasive species is because no animals have the means at this exact point to deal with any predator animals so either God has to give them some of that just enough so that they survive but not enough so that they don't experience some pain and suffering and be in danger constantly from now until the end of time so he's like, he's kind of dealing with it halfway, but not enough to actually make it better. Like, well, it was clearly an important system to him, otherwise he wouldn't have gone through the trouble of saving two of each kind to put on the ark. He didn't want to, you know, he could have started all that over again and, and oh, fixed yeah, the that, system that's after right. the flood. Oh, oh that, that makes it, it okay then. Clearly it was an important thing he wanted to keep in place. So. Yeah, he, he, saved, he saved two at least, so yeah. it wasn't everyone. But. And seven of some of them. Oh, oh. According to some chapters, so we won't yeah. go into which is which. But the, the 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 fun part is, you know, you have all these physical changes going on, and even in the creation narrative, there's no mechanism to explain how any of it happened aside from sin did it. Yeah. But 
Okay, okay, that that's neat. You can say sin, you can say magic, but you need to be able to show how sin interacts with the natural world to just happen to cause all these specific changes. It's it's one of those catch-all explanations that really doesn't explain anything at all. It, ju it just satisfies your mind if you stop thinking about it for two seconds. Well, I grew up in the um, in the Catholic culture, mm -hmm. and believe it or not, they were a lot more easy to deal with on things like this because they were willing to accept, at least in the Catholic tradition I grew up in, that these were probably just stories. These were probably just ways that ancient people explain things uh, to other ancient people to help them understand some sort of a moral lesson, though I've never understood the moral lesson behind why a flood had to kill everybody. Mm -hmm. um, but, you know, we live here in Texas in the world of evangelicals mm -hmm. where they think everything in the Bible is literal, which is so fascinating because if you have any understanding of first century Jewish culture, they were all about parables. They were all mm -hmm. about stories to tell us to tell a tale. Jesus told parables mm -hmm. to um, to send to to teach what he wanted to teach. And so that's what makes all this so much fun is that we get to deal with people who think this stuff is actually mm -hmm. real. Yeah, if I remember correctly, this whole bit of biblical literalism, it's relatively recent it in is. church history. It is. It was not always the case. It came about with the writing of the books The Fundamentals mm -hmm. in the early 1900s with uh, when when people were feeling like the, the uh, church was getting or Christianity was getting too liberal and they mm -hmm. said we need to narrow down what our beliefs really are and the, the series of books was written and from that was launched the fundamentalist movement it's named after those books gotcha. uh, that were written and, um, and and this adherence to things have to be exactly as the Bible says mm -hmm. which the Bible itself doesn't say it has to be that way mm -hmm. yeah so like we were saying, we the uh, we don't know how sin would have these effects, and we, we also don't know why sin would have these effects. Because there's no wolves didn't sin, deer didn't sin. Like, why couldn't they continue going on as normal and mankind who did sin? If if you want to play this game, they sin, they should be the ones to face the consequences. You'd and think, but there's all kinds of examples in the Bible where somebody does something wrong and they kill him, his wife, his kids, and his ox. Mm -hmm. You know, what the ox do? Mm -hmm. And that's supposedly fine, yeah. according to God, but it's okay. Of course, the women and the children yeah. were the man's possession anyway, so it was all about yeah. taking all of his possessions away from mm -hmm. him. It's okay, that was Old Testament, guys. We, we, don't, we yeah. don't do that anymore. It's all new and love and, and, and fun, but... Uh, Speaking of mankind, let, let's talk about Adam and Eve here for okay. a second, because they're getting they're getting kicked out, and now they have this new paradigm to deal with, where they are mortal. They are mortal beings. They no longer have the the garden to feed them and provide for them. They're they're basically kicked out, and they're on their own. So they need to they need to survive now mm -hmm. in this new, may not post apocalyptic, but post sin. Uh, landscape. So you need to figure out how to make this work. Um, now Adam, he has a little bit of knowledge on how to do this because his job in the garden was to cultivate it. So he probably knows a little bit about agriculture, but it's one thing to go from cultivating an existing garden than to plant a new one. Sure, oh and, yeah. And the, the, the Bible doesn't indicate, okay, were, was he planting new plants? Was he uh, just tending the ones that existed there? Did he know anything about uh, planting crops, tilling the soil? Yeah, where's the nutrients in the soil come from? That, that, that comes from, from mm -hmm. other dead plants, and so nothing has died yet. That's a very good point. I hadn't thought of that. Yeah, and, and yeah, exactly. Nothing has died yet. Yeah. So, okay, your, your job is to be a gardener, but death is not a potential consequence of you doing your job wrong. So how do you know if you are cultivating or farming properly if nothing you have done has ever turned out poorly for you? That's true. And you're, it's just you and your wife at this point representing Team Human. So one, one bad... One and God bad. stopped hanging out at the party so we, you don't have him to consult anymore. Yeah, you're like, uh, hey God, how do I... Oh, <laughs> shit. <laughs> So like you you have one bad harvest, you're kind of screwed. Yeah. Um, maybe you can scrape together enough to get by, but um, 
Yeah, speaking of Adam and Eve, my wife and I went to the um, museum, the Smithsonian Museum of Art last year, mm -hmm. and there was all kinds of uh, biblical pictures in there. And the one thing that we noticed is every picture of Adam and Eve, they had belly buttons. Mm -hmm. Why would Adam and Eve need a belly button? They, are, they would not, uh, that would naturally have occurred. You have to put it in there, you know, you got to have the lint collect somewhere, you know, <laughs> just got to throw in there. But, um, and then there's so much more going on. Like, okay, well, let's say your farming goes badly. Well, you can, you can be a gatherer. You, you can mm -hmm. forage for food, but you also have poisonous plants now, because ostensibly that's going to be a consequence of the fall. Some of the things you used to eat are now bad for you. So yeah. if you eat something and die, then once again, humanity is screwed. And you also have no immune system, let's not forget, because there have been no pathogens, no harmful bacteria, viruses that you would have had to fight against. So one bad cough and the only two humans in the world die right and probably most most dangerous like we talked about there are now predator animals roaming yeah. around and you have no frame of reference as to how to deal with them and you may not notice at first glance oh that saber-toothed tiger that used to be my buddy steve <laughs> now he wants to kill me and it really only takes one bad encounter with a saber-toothed tiger, wolf, bear, what have you. And once again, the only two human beings that exist are just wiped off the face of the earth. And so we are not here, unfortunately. You know, it's, it's, we're, we're treating a lot of this with a lot of snark here and, and, and the realization how, how ridiculous it sounds. But what's really scary is Christian apologists' ability to somehow make it all make sense in their own brains. We can, every one of these points, we can find someone who can spend so much energy to come up with mm -hmm. an answer for all this. And, and what a sad state of affairs that that, that, that much energy is um, expelled trying to learn nonsense when we could be using that energy to teach kids real science. Yeah, and then that's kind of the, the, the frustrating thing about it is that there's, no, there's nothing that like all of this could be answered by saying God magic. Yeah. Like, okay, there there was no immune system, God gave them one just just cause I guess it had to be good enough so that they would live a while, but not good enough so they would live forever, so we had to kind of fine tune it so that they would only die eventually and kinda of painfully. But I will give Christians credit. I debate with Christians a lot and, and they, they they tend to steer away from that that was I saw that more in my youth, but now they they really go out there and try to find people who can make all of this make sense. Try mm -hmm. to find someone who they can consider an expert, and um, and again it's tragic because it's it's wasted mm -hmm. wasted brain power, wasted knowledge. Yeah, it's like you you could spend this time uh, trying to rationalize your existing beliefs or trying to make them sound sciency, or you could consider the possibility that you might be wrong about something. And, and keep learning about it but so all that goes to show Genesis kind of silly uh, if you hadn't thought about this aspect before um, and if it is some sort of moral lesson please tell us what it is because I can't figure it out yes if, if God the uh, arbiter and creator of morality is trying to teach us a lesson through all this please comment below and let us know what it is because apparently we're missing something but Randy, Randall, thanks for joining us. Glad to be here. Glad to have you join us. And uh, we'll see you next time on Atheist Edge. Atheist Edge. Walking the edge of what some consider offensive. But your feelings don't matter here. Only facts. So I wanted to make sure that uh, everyone is aware that we do have a local chapter of the Freedom From Religion Foundation here in the DFW area. Our next meeting is going to be March 27th at Los Himadores Restaurant in Bedford. The speaker is going to be Rex Burke, and he's going to be discussing the uh, life in a Christian cult and how we got out of it. So please join us and learn more about the Freedom From Religion Foundation. Edgy commentary on the dangers of doctrine, the foibles of faith, the bullshit of belief, the stupidity of superstition, and the idiocy of indoctrination. With razor-sharp wit, curiosity, and critical thought, we take an unblinking look at today's religions. We are Atheist Edge.